Welcome to our elementary town hall. Uh, we appreciate you uh, attending this evening. Um, and this evening is going to be one where uh, we want to spend quite a bit of time on questions and answers versus presentations. Uh, we will be uh, presenting some highlights of information uh, pertaining to uh, plans for uh, going back in seat. Um, we've had plenty of presentations at our last couple of board meetings. Uh, tonight is really to spend time with, uh, we have a number of staff and community uh, in question answers and dialogue about, um, about plans for in seat. I do wanna preface a few things uh, this evening. Uh, and that is that, um, uh, first of all, you know, not every single detail has been ironed out or uh, figured out at this point. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, uh, moving to, you know, an entirely new paradigm and back uh, and with the protocols that we have to create, uh, there's a lot of minute details that are still in development. So there may be some questions that are asked this evening that we at this point in time don't have an answer to, but certainly in the next month when we are proposed to return, those answers will be figured out. But just, just know that not every single little detail on everything is figured out at this point. So just to caveat as we jump into the conversations this evening. Um, the, uh, the plans that we're going to, to uh, uh, review this evening are, um, uh, for the uh, continuance of our educational uh, instruction as we move into what is proposed to be the month of November and we'll kind of go over uh, timelines and such relative to that. But um, the Board of Education as we uh, began the outset of the school year had um, uh, passed a motion that uh, put us in a remote mode for the first 10 weeks of the school year and that 10 weeks is up as of the first week of November. Uh, and so we've been working feverishly over the past few months in terms of picking up from that point and moving forward. And you know, where do we go from that first week of November that we were remote? Uh, and so uh, we've been working to create a paradigm by where there's a choice for folks. There's a choice for uh, folks that wanna return in seat uh, and there is a choice for folks that want to stay remote. Uh, and we are offering that choice um, whereby if folks are choosing to stay remote, that that uh, remote teaching is done by an Avondale teacher, uh, unlike uh, some other districts that are turning that over to a third party company to provide that instruction. Uh, we've decided we our kids deserve better than that and uh, deserve a better quality and thus um, maintaining that uh, that education with an Avondale teacher. It does come with a sacrifice, however. It does come with um, the propensity for uh, a chance that uh, a student may have a new teacher come November, uh, whether they are in seat, whether they are remote. Uh, we have a finite number of staff and to now make adjustments and accommodate uh, classrooms of remote and classrooms of in seat, it does require um, some shifting of staff uh, and there is a process that's been created internally for that to occur in the, um, uh, within this next month. Uh, and then placements and that communication will come out uh, around the beginning of November, uh, that first week of November. So um, we're asking folks for commitments uh, now. Uh, surveys have been out asking for those commitments uh, for a better part of the past week. Um, and those commitments are necessary for us to uh, begin that staffing process, to begin to pair uh, students with staff, depending on the choices that people want. Uh, and uh, we have a staff survey out simultaneously with the uh, parent surveys, uh, so that uh, upon the end of the day on this Friday the 16th, we will be now going through over the next a couple of weeks with an, uh, quite a complex staffing process of looking at the in-seat choices, looking at uh, the staffing paradigm, uh, and then making those matches, and then getting that communication out from there. So that, that is a, a complex process that will begin after, uh, after this Friday. 
Um, we will be contacting families that have not yet responded uh, to get them to respond. Again, it is critical that we get responses so that we can most accurately staff to meet the needs uh, of our community. So uh, that is the, the tall and short of it uh, in terms of the process for moving into this next paradigm. Uh, so Julie, if you go ahead and, and start our PowerPoint, we'll kind of go over what we're going to review this evening. So, uh, so first of all, you have a, a slide here that's coming up. So uh, this town hall is, uh, we've divvied it up in terms of elementary, and then we have a secondary session that will begin about 7.30, uh, and we're going to try to stay to that timeline as much as possible. Um, Julie, go ahead and scroll up so we can see the entire slide. So uh, I just want to welcome, we've got our, oops, go ahead. Uh, we have our administrative team that is uh, with us this evening. Uh, so I want to welcome all of our administrators. We have our school nurses also uh, that are with us today. So uh, again, I want to welcome Carrie, uh, who's representing the nurses this evening uh, for our, our uh, COVID related questions. Uh, transportation, uh, Mr. Ken Cook is with us today, food service, Evan Manning, and of course we have our safety coordinator, Dan Chenoweth, that uh, is with us as well. So I wanna just welcome those folks uh, to this, this meeting um, and thank you for all of your input throughout this process. Uh, so, uh, and again, I wanna thank uh, particularly all of the folks from our community uh, and our staff at large that have assisted in our committees that have been working throughout the summer months, right in through the fall, that has helped to design uh, these processes and protocols. Uh, we've been very, very busy. Uh, it's an understatement uh, since, since uh, we began in June with looking to come back to school uh, and getting back in seat. So uh, we're at a juncture now that we feel we can um, move into that paradigm. Uh, our surveys are showing roughly 60-40, 60, uh, 60 wanting in seat, 40 wanting uh, uh, remote. Uh, and so, you know, there's a confidence level that uh, is there to uh, uh, certainly uh, support going back in. Uh, our COVID data uh, in this area, this location is uh, continuing to be uh, lower and con more conducive to holding classes. Uh, our nurses, as well as the Oakland County Health Department have been with us all along the way to advise schools and you know schools all on our borders and everywhere else that has been remote are planning just as we are to go back in seat uh, for those families that want to. Uh, and again, we're, we're uh, offering that choice uh, to stay remote or to move in seat. Um, so go ahead, next slide. So tonight we're gonna cover uh, some areas uh, of topics um, health and safety. Uh, we're going to go over our implementation timeline uh, of folks coming back, talk about instruction, curriculum and instruction questions, uh, special populations, which is special education, English as a second language, at risk, uh, 504s, uh, all students that fit in those categories, uh, uh, enrollment commitment, which I spoke a little bit about here. Uh, we'll talk about schedules and what the schedules will look like in seat uh, as we move forward transportation, uh, some of those protocols, food service, uh, you know, that's cafeteria. Uh, students will be eating in the cafeterias, not in classrooms uh, for their lunches. And so uh, we've got some parameters that surround what that looks like. Uh, and then of course, you know, funding and uh, where we're applying the federal COVID dollars that the district is receiving to help support these protocols uh, that we are uh, undertaking. So, We'll go ahead and start um, with our uh, first topic is health and safety. And um, what we've done is we've had a number of folks had that have emailed us questions in advance. Uh, and we have categorized those according to these topics and we're going to address those questions uh, that, have been, um, uh, that have been sent to us. Uh, and we're also taking questions this evening from folks 
uh, that are here live uh, that we will answer toward the end of our session. So if you have questions, uh, you can email them to us. Um, and that email address is avondale.boe at avondaleschools.org. Again, that's avondale.boe at avondaleschools.org. So you can go ahead and email questions as you have them, uh, and we will address those live questions uh, as we move uh, toward the end of our sessions uh, this evening. So with health and safety, um, you can go to the next slide. Oh, no, nope, go back. So health and safety, let's, let's talk about this. So we're gonna start with, a, with questions. So the question uh, that we have here is, uh, what are the protocols and rules for passing time in the hallways at middle school and high school and who will be monitoring? So the, the uh, protocols and rules for passing time in the hallways in high schools. So the protocols in the, uh, the hallways are going to be essentially, uh, primarily at the high school, we'll be creating one-way hallways. Uh, in the middle school, we will have divisions in the hallways so that students are staying to one side uh, or the other. So, um, uh, you know, th there will be uh, markers on the floors that will help guide and keep students uh, whether it's a one-way hallway or whether it is a divided hallway. Uh, and who will be monitoring those will be the administrators, uh, our security personnel, um, our teachers as they're in and out, um, making sure that students are adhering to those. We're also having staggered releases within uh, release times, transitions. Uh, the transition time uh, between periods is going to be longer uh, mm -hmm. so that you uh, uh, are able to dismiss classes uh, so that not all kids are dismissed at once. We will be staggered dismissals uh, so that, again, it, it will decrease the amount of congestion in hallways or traffic in hallways uh, during these times. So, I hate to interrupt, but isn't this the elementary town hall? That is correct. Okay. I, I didn't know what this had to do with elementary it, students. Okay. Thank you. And elementary will be the same way. Elementary will have hallways that will be divided. Students will be to one side or the other uh, with traffic. Um, so that there is not, you know, a congregation of kids moving in the hallways that are going opposite to each other. Again, we're very cognizant to cohort uh, and transition students uh, in hallways uh, to avoid um, the, the mixing of students as much as possible. Um, question about what will be done if a case develops in school? Uh, how will that be communicated and handled? Uh, how will families be informed in case a student uh, or a case develops in, in, the, uh, in the school, whether it's a student or a teacher or some staff member? So, uh, Mr. Dan Trudell, I'm going to turn that over to you because that is your committee and your, uh, what, you, what you guys have been working on with the health department. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Schwarz, and good evening to everybody. Um, I'm glad everyone could make it out for tonight's town hall and hopefully we'll be able to answer um, as many questions as we can this evening. Um, so with respect to the cases developing in school, um, that is a case where um, if a student or even a staff member starts exhibiting symptoms, um, we have isolation rooms in every building, um, which we will designate for anybody that is starting to have symptoms. They would be re required to go down to this isolation room where they would have um, a KN95 or an N95 mask placed on them. Um, and then they would wait there to be picked up by a parent or guardian. A staff member may wait there as well if they don't have a ride or if for some reason they can't drive home, um, they would be required to wait in this room um, for, for that ride. So in terms of handling the communications, um, once a student or a staff member exhibits symptoms, we would then be in contact with our, our nursing staff on hand as well as the county health department. Um, and then at that point, we would be um, issuing a brochure that Annette McAvoy has created for the district. Um, this brochure would essentially have all the applicable information um, for the student or the staff member with respect to what symptoms to look for, testing locations they can seek, um, and then the further guidance that we would have for, um, you know, quarantine periods that would be required and things of that nature. So um, that'll be given out every time somebody does go to those isolation rooms just to give them the information they need um, with how to proceed. Um, from that time. And then if there is a positive case, we would be working with the county health department at that point 
they would look at contact tracing where they would help determine who is a close contact and then notification would be sent to those close contacts um, with what to do next, um, the period of time in which they have to look out for symptoms themselves and then um, the date that they would be able to return. So um, depending on the class, a close contact is defined as if you've been within six feet for more than 15 minutes to an individual that was confirmed to be positive. Um, and so that's that collaboration between the building level administration, the, the teaching staff, and then um, central office working with the health department to determine who would be considered close contact. So um, it's not always a case where the entire class is going to be sent home for two weeks. Um, it really just depends on um, the seating arrangements where we're, we're looking to do assigned seating in all of the rooms and have kids in cohorts. That way it makes it a little bit easier for us to help contact trace with the health department. Um, just that, that way we can have an efficient process where um, we can look at, you know, who is a close contact and whether or not they need to be self-isolating as well in addition to the positive case. All right, the next question is on uh, lunch and how will lunch be managed? So as I mentioned earlier, lunch will be um, taking place not in the classrooms. Lunch will be in the cafeterias uh, and uh, other locations that are necessary to accommodate social distancing. So when students are eating um, and they're in an area where they do not have their mask, such as that, uh, so we are seating students at a range of six to eight feet uh, to, uh, and to make that accommodation, there will be uh, the cafeteria, we may have to use a gymnasium, we may have to use a media center uh, or all of those locations, depending on the size of the group uh, to uh, eat lunch. So we are staying to the range of six to eight feet between students uh, in the lunchroom because they don't have a mask at that point in time. So uh, we will be using other facilities other than just the, the cafeteria for that. Uh, students will be assigned uh, uh, in a, uh, by their class. So they'll have specific seating areas for that class to stay together because our whole notion of cohorting will remain throughout the day, even when they're at lunch. So there will be designated seating areas for them. Uh, and then they will be assigned also uh, at recess to stay in a cohorted group. Uh, at recess time, there, will, there is a time for a mask break. Uh, so as students can maintain social distancing uh, outside, they will be able to remove their mask uh, and have a, a mask break at that time. There will also be designated mask breaks throughout the day uh, with social distancing where a student can remove their mask uh, because we, we know that that is difficult to wear all day long, certainly. So, uh, but uh, as far as the lunchroom goes, that six to eight foot uh, range is what we're shooting for. And, um, and again, that will be looking differently at each building because all of our buildings are uh, uh, different in terms of sizes of cafeterias and sizes of, of their facilities. Uh, but we will, uh, there are specific plans at each of the buildings that will accommodate uh, that spacing of students. Dr. Schwartz, if I could interrupt, this is Mrs. Monroe. On um, slides 37 and 38 of our presentation, we also address some of the questions about lunch and breakfast. Uh, it might help. Um, many of the elementary questions came in about, can my child take a break um, during lunch or during um, breakfast eating time with um, students that are not in their class, can they um, take, can they eat with somebody that's not in their classroom? And like Dr. Schwartz said, um, students will be in cohorts, um, so assigned an eating area and a resource area. Um, but there were also some breakfast questions that are applicable at this time. Students who use our breakfast service will be eating breakfast in classrooms or in assigned areas, so that when they first get to school. However, we are this will look different in each elementary because we're assigning these areas with that eight foot radius for seating so that masks can be off. So it's not every classroom and not every student takes breakfast. We know that. Um, that's why we're working with principals for hallway or appropriate common area. But um, there were several questions about whether or not students could eat with, with students from different classes. We wanna make sure you know that we're cohorting for safety reasons. So it's within the classroom for breakfast, lunch, 
and recess. On slide 38, there's a picture of, I believe there's an elementary class, or cafeteria picture, yep. So we have one elementary, one high school set up. You'll see that we're going to be using every common space possible. Um, and so we're gonna just be so thankful to our administrators and teachers who are accommodating. Uh, right now we're planning on about 60% of our population um, that will be in person. So we need to make sure that we've got appropriate eight foot distancing at lunchtime um, for 60% of our population. So thank you for allowing me to interrupt. Thank you, thank you. Uh, next question refers to transportation, and that is, how will busing be managed to allow for social distancing? Uh, so I don't know if we have a slide on transportation. Yep, as Mr. Trudell, um, we'll talk on slide 24 on uh, transportation, and uh, Mr. Ken Cook is also uh, on hand to help us out as well. Mr. Trudell? Thanks, Marianne. Um, so as you can see on this slide here, um, we'll, we'll just touch briefly on the cleaning protocols as well. So um, buses after every run will have all the high touch points wiped down um, with a disinfectant. So this would include seats, seat belts, handles, buckles, all the handrails, um, anything that a student would be touching uh, potentially, we will be wiping those down in between runs um, using paper towel and a disinfectant. And then on Monday or on Wednesdays and Fridays at the end of the day, we will be using a fogging machine um, to hit the entire bus. So that would include a lot of the surfaces that really aren't being touched frequently or at all. Um, but we want to ensure that we're going to um, hit all of those as well, at least twice a week there. So we'll be using those fogging machines on those two days. And this will coincide with the, the building protocols that we'll go over here shortly um, with the sprayers. Um, and this is all in accordance with the state and local health department guidelines. Um, and obviously that's subject to change depending on, on any updates they may issue to us. Um, in terms of boarding the bus, uh, everyone will be required to use the hand sanitizer. There have been units installed at the entrance point to every bus. Um, so students will be re required to use the hand sanitizer upon entering the bus and they must have their mask and keep their mask on while riding the bus um, for the duration of the trip. And then they'll proceed to the back of the bus first. So we'll seat rear to front um, and the first available seat in the back would be filled. Um, and we're looking to do a, one, one student per seat, um, but for runs where we know that we're gonna have more than that capacity, we'll look to um, use two kids per seat. Um, again, obviously uh, maintaining the masks is critical. Uh, departing the bus, um, we'll be dismissing from the front to back. So the bus driver will dismiss by rows. Um, students are not required to use the hand sanitizer upon exiting the bus, but obviously they're more than welcome to um, and they're encouraged to do so. And then um, any students that violate the mask requirements on the bus, we would obviously have um, discussions with those students just to ensure that um, they're following the mask policy um, as required by the district. And I think, was there another slide after this, Julie? No. Or is that the only one? Yep, everything for transportation is on one. Okay, yep. Okay, uh, the next question, and I believe this one is for Carrie, uh, our school nurse, uh, probably would be best to uh, answer this question, and it is, who determines if a child is sick enough to be quarantined or sent home? Uh, some of the COVID symptoms are minor things that sometimes students complain about, like headaches, uh, uh, will him, stating that his head hurts or him feeling tired uh, require him to be sent home. Right. Hi, everybody. My name is Carrie Quitmeyer, and I'm a nurse working with the um, Oakland County Health Department. And um, this is definitely a challenging question. So what if the student is um, showing a sign or symptom of COVID, and that could be a headache, which seems pretty mild, um, we're gonna ask you, is that a symptom of COVID? And the answer is yes, it is a symptom. So we're gonna to have to treat it that way in order to protect the rest of our population as a whole. So that child with a headache would come to the health room where there will be um, a staff member. They'll notify the parents. And then we're gonna recommend that you um, speak with your healthcare provider and get a COVID test and then follow the um, guidance from there. 
Now I do want to add, I know we're going into cold and flu season and the health department is aware of that also. And all of these symptoms are so vague. So the health department is working on um, classifying these symptoms as either high risk or low risk. So our screening tool might change in the upcoming weeks to try and um, help determine that. So we can try and pick apart those symptoms. Um, so hopefully that will be coming out soon, which will help with some of these vague symptoms. Um, we also have, they have the slide up right here. We've partnered with Beaumont Hospital and they are um, doing a referral line. So in the morning when you're screening your kids at home and you're not sure if you should keep them home from school, you can call this hotline and it's staffed by um, Beaumont healthcare providers and you can ask them your questions. It's open from five to eight in the morning and they can help guide you if you should send your kid to school or if you should keep your kid home and give you some guidance with some of those questions as well. So I hope that helps. I know it's, I know it's frustrating and challenging, but we do have to um, be very cautious and conservative with these COVID symptoms. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Uh, next question is, with the removal of the executive powers of, of the governor uh, in per pertaining to her executive orders, what are the metrics that Avondale will be employing and what organizations will Avondale be looking to to get information on ongoing safety in the greater community? So uh, with that, uh, we are, are certainly partnered with the Oakland County Health Department uh, as, you know, with, you know, our school nurses that are working with us in the school district. We receive uh, weekly statistical information about our local COVID rates uh, and the age groups uh, that they pertain to uh, that help to aid in our decision making uh, on the various age groups of students within school and what, uh, you know, what measures are, are necessary for continued prevention as, as well as response. Uh, so we are working closely with them. Uh, we also, have orders from um, uh, the Michigan Department of Health and, and uh, Human Safety, DHHS, uh, that have essentially replaced those executive orders. Uh, they have, they carry uh, the same authority. Uh, and basically what was in the executive orders from the governor that had been revoked, have been reinstated uh, from the Michigan uh, Statewide Health Department. So, um, so we are, are bound by those protocols uh, no differently than what we were under the executive orders. So with that and working with our local health department and looking uh, continually at our local COVID rates, um, that's how we are working to make decisions relative to uh, school, whether it's remote, in seat, and so on. Um, question about, will parents be notified if a student or staff are quarantined for positive or possible COVID? Uh, regardless or if the classroom is closed by the health department. So in other words, are parents going to be notified uh, pertaining to COVID cases? And um, if, a, if a classroom is closed or a school is closed, um, and, and will parents know how close the contact was? So Dan, you've got, uh, or yep. Carrie. Yeah, I can touch on this one real quick. Um, so we just put up this slide here. This just kind of goes over the, the communication process. Um, but really up, up until this point, what we've been doing is if we have a, a reported positive case, um, we reach out to the county health department and then they assign a case investigator to us. And at that point, um, they're the ones that are compiling the data with, um, with respect to who are we going to be contacting about this. So if it's an isolated incident with an athletic team or something like that, um, they would request that we send out um, a notification to the close contacts on that team. And then that we also send out a general communication um, to the entire team. That way everybody on that team is informed and aware that, you know, there are close contacts on the team. There was somebody that tested positive, but also just kind of like that heads up of, you know, if you are a close contact of a close contact, just kind of keep an eye out for these symptoms that, that may occur. Um, but if you're not considered a close contact, you're obviously still welcome to come back to school and participate in all the school activities. So um, that communication um, decision comes from the health department. If they deem that, you know, if it's a student within a building and not, you know, just an athletic program, 
if that student is in different classes, like within a high school or something like that, um, they would then help determine if there needs to be a notification sent to multiple classes or if it needs to be a building wide or even a district wide communication. So um, they have letters drafted that we can send out. We just have to tailor them to our district. Um, and then from there, they will pinpoint that communication to who they deem appropriate. Thank you. On the same topic, if an elementary teacher must quarantine, uh, will her class quarantine at the same time uh, and switch their learning to remote for the duration of the quarantine? Or does a substitute come in? So if an elementary teacher has to quarantine, uh, does the entire class have to quarantine? Uh, that would depend on, uh, again, and correct me if I'm wrong, Carrie, but it would be if, if whosoever's in proximity for that, that formula of if you're within six feet for a consistent 15 minute period or more, then you become somebody who must also quarantine. Right, that's correct. So when we're looking for close contacts, we're looking for um, within six feet for a cumulative 15 minutes or more. So that's why we're talking about seating charts being so important or cohorting even your classes into smaller groups. Um, that way we can pinpoint exactly where that, um, that contact is. Now with a staff member, it is gonna be a lot harder because your staff member is probably going to be in contact with all of the students, especially in an elementary school. So if it's a staff member, the likelihood of quarantining an entire class is going to be higher than if it was a student in that class because you'll have a lot easier time probably um, keeping your students separated or in seating charts separated than you would with the staff member, I'm guessing. But that's what they'll be asking about to determine the quarantine. So, and then students who that are, that are uh, having to quarantine because of either uh, uh, being in contact with another student or such, uh, and has to be out, uh, then the remote learning would be the mode for that student. So that student still receives uh, education similar to they, if they would on an extended absence. Um, so they would be out on quarantine and receiving uh, instruction, again, just as they would in prior days if they were on an extended absence from the classroom. Um, so uh, they would have a, a remote instruction or asynchronous work uh, that is provided by the teacher, um, you know, handled, again, similarly to an absence in prior days. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Let's see what other... That, those are the questions I have that pertain to elementary for, uh, for health and safety that have been pre-submitted. All right, so we'll move on to... Um, our next slide, our next topic, slide 28. So slide 28 has to do with instruction. All right, so uh, we have curriculum and instruction questions. And again, the ones I'm reading off of here are the ones that have been pre-submitted. Um, it says, what will in-person, well, what will in-person instruction look like? Uh, five days, three days, two days. So we probably should go to explaining what the schedules look like, because there's a number of questions just about what are the schedules, uh, you know, what do the schedules look like? So why don't we take a look at that? So here's a so go ahead, Colleen, with an elementary schedule, since that's what's pertinent to this evening, audience. Everybody. Thank you, Dr. Shores. Um, good evening, everybody. This is an example of an elementary remote weekly schedule. It does mimic the in-person schedule. 
So um, the difference between a remote schedule and an in-person schedule is that um, you're going to see some indications on here for synchronous and asynchronous. And in, um, in a regular classroom, we would just say that this is live teaching and then maybe independent work. And what this is is a sample because we do have to build a master schedule. So currently, we do have some, um, most of our, our courses, our elective courses are going on in the afternoon and same with any type of intervention. And, um, and that won't necessarily be the case when we get into our new situation. So um, I do have that reflected in this sample schedule. So as you move down through the schedule, you're gonna see morning meetings, snack breaks. Those are typical in person or remote. You're gonna see ELA and math blocks, and then also um, small groups, and it says adaptive computer programs. So yes, we may be using those remotely, but developmentally appropriate adaptive computer programs are sometimes used in person as well. That's a tool that we have used in person as well. Um, lunch and recess will still take place remotely and in person. Um, if we scroll down, please. So you can see that it says um, at this point there are small groups or specials in reading or math. And then again, we have um, so social studies and science in a block and also another block of specials. What um, a remote teacher will have to balance is the same as any teacher in person is when um, when they have those those specials, they will um, the students will be taught by another by another teacher. So at that point, if um, that is a planning period for the teacher, and then students will be obviously with another with another teacher. This doesn't always happen in the afternoon in an in person. It could happen at any point during the day based on the master schedule. And this is again, just a sample schedule. So we may have specials at um, an earlier time in the day and then maybe that reading and math block at a later time. So as we build those master schedules, we, we know that this, this is just a sample and this may change. However, the bookends of the day are the same. So we start school at the same time, we end school at the same time. And um, on those Wednesdays, we will have that early release Wednesday, and that is for teacher PLCs. So um, during that time, students can work on assignments that they have been assigned earlier in the day, and teachers will be working together to make sure that they are planning together. That is on Wednesday. Dr. Schwartz, I can't hear you. That mute button, <laughs> I forget about it. Um, question about uh, if, if an in-person learner is forced to stay home uh, due to uh, quarantining, how will that learning look at that time? Will students get homework packets, Zoom meetings? Uh, what, what will that look like if they have to quarantine? <laughs> That is a, it's a good question. I think you did hit on it a little bit earlier when you talked about the teachers. Um, our teachers will still have to maintain a Google Classroom and some of them who you see saw will most likely maintain that as well. So that we do have the ability to assign assignments through the Google Classroom. So yes, packets may be something that they find um, and parents may find more useful depending on the student. Also depending on whether the student is quarantining because they're ill. So it'll be typical to what we would do for a student who would be sick for the flu or uh, any other type of two week illness. Next question is, will in-person students be using Chromebooks or other devices to complete work during school? Uh, or will, we, will they be going back to paper pencil work? Uh, if teachers are not allowed to walk up and down aisles, 
to check progress because of the six foot rule will students uh, still be completing their work on computers instead of uh, on paper? So we consider the computers a tool. So if it's developmentally appropriate and the teacher would like to use those, typically we would be use, we would send kids to a lab. We're not going to have that opportunity because we're cohorting. So most likely any kind of computer work would not necessarily be done in the classroom. However, um, if it is appropriate and we are one-to-one -one at the time, teachers may ask and principals may work with um, those teachers to bring in those tools. We definitely don't wanna take away any learning tools from students, including paper pencil, including um, dry erase boards, um, any kind of manipulatives. We're gonna do our best to um, keep everybody safe, but obviously we don't wanna share materials. But sharing materials doesn't necessarily mean that all hands-on materials are, are off limits. So a follow-up question is, will students be required to bring uh, equipment back and forth from home to school each day? Uh, it says, if not, then will families be able to keep borrowing the school-issued technology uh, in case of a shutdown or having to go virtual quickly? I know some of these details we still have to work out with principals. Um, it depends on space and how we want to organize cubbies. So we'll have to uh, work out some of that with principals. PPE will have to go home and get washed. So if they're bringing masks from home, um, obviously those will go back and forth to get washed. Uh, but we, we would expect um, some things to be present in the school. And we, it's going to depend on the building and storage and making sure that everybody is socially distancing and not sharing materials. Uh, this is a special education question. So this is for Marianne. Uh, my child has an IEP and is currently receiving assistance each day uh, within breakout rooms during math and other classes. And he also has access to other resource teachers during their office hours. Uh, and it says, this has been wonderful. Prior to COVID, he received these services more sporadically during the week uh, and was taken uh, with a small group to resource room, et cetera. How will these services look for him and others when they return back to in-person learning? Thank you for that question. Um, just wanna make sure that you can hear me. I think you can, thumbs up or maybe. Uh, so first I wanna acknowledge how awesome this question is because this has been an advantage of some of our virtual and Zoom options in special education have actually increased one-on-one -on -one or small group uh, intervention accommodations and supplemental aids. Uh, we are starting the work with our special education providers to understand what that push-in support would look like and also pull out support by cohort only. Um, I will be able to detail schedules as soon as enrollment forms are completed, but I want you to hear from an elementary point of view uh, I am working with our special education providers to make sure that we are not pulling students from multiple cohorts for that small group instruction, accommodation, or supplemental aids. So we have identified areas in each building that are close to the cohorts when pull out support or services are necessary. Uh, specifically like speech, social work, or small group instruction. Uh, but we are encouraging that that specialized instruction be pushed in into cohorts uh, and respecting uh, staff rotation times. It is something that we will work together to perfect in a way that is best for students, but also honoring the needs of staff. And our special ed providers, uh, many of them met with me today on the same topic. Uh, so we're eager to finalize those schedules. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that, those are our instructional questions that we've had pre-submitted. So, so Dr. Schwartz, I just received a question from uh, someone live. They're, oh. actually, they're actually asking for more uh, detail on what a cohort is. Oh, good, okay. Um, and so Mrs. Brunei and I can actually probably uh, support describing this, but a cohort or any one of our administrators, a cohort is the same like grouped students um, that are with each other at the elementary setting for the majority of the day. 
for example, a first grade classroom or a second grade classroom and so on. Uh, cohort would be um, eating lunch together, uh, had they had receiving any of their specials instruction together. So when I talk about special education pushing into one cohort, uh, we're not mixing groups of students. Mrs. Brunei, do you want to expand on that or do you feel like did I do a good job? I think you did a good job. I think I try to to um, to describe it as this is your group. This is who you stay with. You're with that group all day long. Um, and when it comes to contract contact tracing, it's very easy in a cohorting situation to be able to trace um, who's been around whom. Thank you for that. All right. Um, I'd like for us to jump to uh, the timeline, um, if we can, Julie. So whatever slide we have the timeline on, it's toward the beginning. So the timeline uh, that we've established is um, uh, that we are looking at that November 16th date. And again, these are tentative dates. Uh, but this is timely for elementary, for our gifted and talented school, our middle school, uh, for when the uh, trimester ends. So we are working to align the start of students coming back. Uh, and you can see through the schedule here uh, of a gradual return uh, of students really in that couple of weeks prior to Thanksgiving. So that um, we are bringing in from an elementary perspective, our, our transitional kindergarten through grade two, uh, alphabet wise, half the alphabet one day, then the other half the alphabet another day, uh, and then they all report on that Wednesday and then grades three through five uh, on that Thursday and Friday. Uh, simultaneously, uh, our gift and talented school begins at grade two uh, and goes through grade seven. Uh, and they, as you see there, would transition uh, through that week uh, uh, this is so that we can concentrate resources to assist in instructing students in smaller groups with the new reality that they're, that they're facing. Uh, and they need instruction on what social distancing is uh, and how that is now a part of their day and how they operate within that social distancing framework. Uh, hand washing also is now something that is a regular part of every day. Uh, and so proper hand washing techniques uh, mask wearing. Uh, mask wearing uh, is, you know, uh, something that, again, proper mask wearing, something that particularly younger students will need uh, instruction on. Uh, so we're concentrating resources there to, uh, to accommodate that. That's why we're bringing folks back in smaller groups and kind of um, uh, we're better able to control the environment and, and the growth within that environment uh, on that continuum. Uh, middle school, we would be looking at coming in on that, that uh, 17th with just sixth graders. Uh, sixth graders are new to that building, so uh, we need some concentrated time with just that group to get acquainted to their new school uh, and, uh, and uh, that facility. So we have uh, sixth grade students in for a couple days, and then we bring in the seventh and eighth graders at the latter part of that week. Um, high school. Uh, there's been a, uh, uh, I'll say, a change here. Um, and, and, and so here's a question that came in that kind of goes with this. It says, have you considered bringing back high school at the semester uh, uh, while phasing in elementary and middle schools in, at the trimester in November? Uh, it seems that it would be a more logical choice that would help with continuity of learning, class credits, grading, and such, uh, and lead to a more gradual return of students. So uh, originally, we've we had proposed that high school would be returning uh, in a similar fashion to middle school uh, in that November timeframe. Uh, we received quite a bit of feedback from parents, from staff, uh, particularly after our last two board meetings um, and, and have had a lot of conversations with folks about pushing the, uh, the high school start to the end of their semester. Um, so, it does get messy when you are uh, making change in the middle of a semester, such as this would be, uh, with things like grading, uh, 
teacher change, class change, trying to maintain the continuity uh, of, uh, of instruction uh, for students. Um, and so, you know, we're looking uh, in proposing that maybe we push that to the semester, uh, which would be in that second week or so of January um, after, after the, uh, the holiday break. So um, we're seeing that other districts are, are likewise doing very similar. Uh, I know Waterford, Wald Lake uh, just announced that they are moving their high school now to second semester. Uh, so we're starting to see some changes. We also know that uh, this age group, of, of any of the age groups, uh, school age age groups, that are most prone to COVID because this is the most social group uh, and they just can't not be social. So, um, you know, when you look at the data, this is the most worrisome group uh, as, uh, you know, we're, as we look at the childhood statistics of COVID. Uh, and so um, with that, uh, you know, we're a little more cautious with, with that group as, it, as our other districts and other high schools. And I don't want to get into a, a situation where we're starting and stopping and starting and stopping, where we've got kids coming in and then we end up having to quarantine classrooms or close the school, you know, like Novi and, and Lance Cruz and other schools have had to do and then and reopen and restart. And we really don't want to get into that. So, um, so us, much like uh, other districts are, are deciding to do is, is moving that to the semester uh, break. So again, it's, a, it's an even start point for the high school, just as the end of the trimester is an even start point for K through eight. So, um, so we're kind of leaning in that direction of uh, amending that proposal to, uh, to that end. And we've had a lot of commentary uh, from that, particularly from our board meetings and, and, and post board meetings uh, about that. So, so that answers that question. So uh, the K-8 would be in for, um, certainly by Thanksgiving is our, is our plan. Um, so there's questions about enrollment. So if we wanna jump to the enrollment question or the enrollment slides. All right, so currently um, when we look at our community surveys, uh, we have just under 2,500 responses, uh, and it's panning out today as of, you know, 53.3 to 46.7. Uh, the 53.3 is uh, in person, uh, and uh, the 46 is, is preferring remote. So we're, we're getting to that 50-50 mark. 60-40, um, depending on the day, 50-50 on another day. And so it's trending in that range. And so that, um, um, and these are the confirmed responses that we've, we've received thus far. Uh, so this is certainly will uh, help us to plan for our, our students coming back, our buildings to be between 50 and 60% capacity, uh, which really assists us with social distancing uh, when we're looking at only roughly half the students being there. Um, so that, that helps in, in accommodating a social distancing to a point where we don't need to do the alternate type of schedules uh, that you see other districts doing where half the alphabet comes one day, the other half the alphabet comes the other day. Um, this helps us to not have to go that route. Um, those alternate day situations are not ideal instructionally. Uh, by any means. Uh, it's really double duty on the part of teachers having to prep for remote and seated and teaching both at the same time. Uh, and at the end of the day, you're only teaching half the curriculum. Uh, so uh, really, those are, are very poor models, certainly long term, uh, to try and sustain. So having this helps us to not have to get into those types of schedules. Um, questions about folks that have uh, submitted their, their commitments, you know, are there circumstances under which a family may be given the option to change their choice? Uh, and, and we do have a, a process that we have, are developing for families that may want to change their mind. Certainly you can, while the application is still open, you can change. Uh, we're going to take what the most recent responses are. Uh, as of 
the end of the day Friday. Um, if, uh, you know, we've had questions about, shall, you know, is there another point in time in the year by which we can uh, uh, request a change? If I'm coming from remote into in seat, uh, you know, is there a process? And so we are developing a process for that to occur where students would, uh, you know, possibly at the third trimester uh, have that switch. Uh, but we have to be very cognizant that we don't want to create um, a large scale staff change in the district. As I mentioned earlier, um, to that. Uh, it becomes very problematic with a finite number of staff where you have teachers remote and teachers that are slated as in seat. Um, that if we have people coming and going, uh, that is very disruptive. Uh, where you know, uh, you know, we have possibilities that if we have a lot of people moving, that it's conceivable that every few weeks a student would have a new teacher, uh, and and. That's not good for anybody. That's not good for the instruction uh, for the student or the, or the teacher. Um, so we really want to minimize those transitions. So uh, if there are extenuating circumstances that would require a student to go from remote to in seat, for example, you know, there's this process that we're putting together that is basically based on, you know, are there medical reasons why? Are there performance reasons why? Um, uh, because we don't want to just have people switching because it's more convenient for the family over one week over another and so on and so forth. We just can't accommodate that uh, and, and switch staffing all around. So Colleen, if you want to spend a moment on this process. Yes, thank you. Uh, we recognize that there may be um, extenuating circumstances for a change in setting. And we know that um, often the first point of contact is the teacher. So what we have shown in this, this flowchart is to begin with, a parent or staff member would request a um, placement change for that, for that child and they would consult with the principal. The principal would use a letter and a checklist that we have to identify the reasoning and um, what those extenuating circumstances are and um, why this is in the best interest of the child. And then if that student um, ha receives special services, then that letter would then go on to Mrs. Monroe and Mrs. Monroe would, um, would consult with the parents on, um, on the decision around and work with the parents on um, the decision that whether or not we should make that change. Um, if the student does not receive special services as just general education services, then that student's request would come to me and we would consult around, um, around something called a change rubric and then we would we would figure out what is the best placement for the child. So there is a process um, that starts with the, with the classroom or um, building principal, uh, classroom teacher building principal, and then moves through uh, central office so that we can make sure that we make those decisions as a community. Again, it, it is what will be in the best interest of the child. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. All right, um, Julie, let's go back to the menu because uh, that completes our enrollment questions that we have. Um, Actually, Dr. Schwartz, may I, there was a development with our enrollment commitment form following the board meeting. So Julie, if you could just go back to uh, one slide, I believe. And we can talk about our default enrollment oh, settings. Yes. Yep, yep. Uh, so I would like to share, and I'm sure Dr. Schwartz will echo that we heard community input, uh, community input, uh, board member input, uh, staffing and parent request about the default enrollment settings of our commitment form. Uh, so Dr. Schwartz, uh, the, while the deadline is still October 16th at 3 p.m., the default enrollment setting uh, will go to online or remote for students who have not completed the form. However, we are putting it in a process where building teams will then be able to review the performance and engagement of those students and really confirm. Uh, we can't just 
automatically just assume that if you didn't fill out your commitment form that you want remote or in seat, we're going to follow up with those people, but the default will go to, enro will go to remote while we do that work. Um, and that is really based off of community feedback. So I hope that's helpful. Yep. Yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, Julie, put up the, I just want to see the menu of what the other slides. Uh, da, 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 da. Mm. So ooh. let's move to uh, staffing because we have some questions here on staffing that have been pre-submitted. Is there a slide? So 15, slide 15. All right, so student and staff uh, placements. Uh, so we've got, again, communication regarding placements throughout the process after we go through the um, parent requests and the staff requests. Uh, that communication communications will be sent to the parents by November 6th. Uh, and then uh, we'll have staff communications that'll be done by our HR department. Uh, and then parent student communications will be by our, uh, our building principals. Uh, and so that all of those placement information uh, will come out you know, by that point in time. Some questions that surround staffing. Uh, and again, this is, um, really about, uh, looks to be about teachers that are um, exposed to COVID. So here's a question, is an exposed teacher be transitioned to remote teaching for required isolation time um, or until the potential case is determined to, to be negative so that the teacher does not inadvertently expose other students? So Mrs. Hyde, I believe that's your question. Good evening, everyone. As far as a staff member being exposed, um, I would definitely be in touch with the epidemiologist or with Carrie, one of our nurses. Um, but of course, if the teacher is exposed and needs to quarantine, um, we would have the teacher teach remotely if the teacher is not too sick to make that happen. Um, and we would make sure that we continue instruction for the students. Next question is, will teachers who have um, and now a teacher who is quarantined um, because of COVID-19, we have worked it out with the teachers union as well as our paraprofessionals and our other unions um, that they will not have these days deducted um, from their absence account. Um, if they are able to teach remotely, we will ask them to do that, um, but they will document their absences in our attendance system, which is currently Red Rover, um, and they would denote COVID-19. Um, if a family member within their family gets sick, um, that would be an individual cases, and they would wanna reach out to me, and I would assist them with looking at any possible leaves that they could take to support their family members. All right, thank you. Uh, so those are the questions that I have pertaining to uh, that topic. Uh, so go ahead, Julie, put the menu back up so I can see what slides we've got and what we haven't covered yet. Uh, da, da, da. Do you have some instruction questions? Uh, we, I think we covered... I think we covered, did we cover the health room or how we're going to get fresh air? Did we cover that? All right. We have some more instructions. These are three real quick. So, um, okay, I have some questions here that are, um, one is, will elementary students no longer be able to have a snack break in their classrooms? 
So who would like to answer that question? Snack breaks in classrooms. Good evening. Um, snack breaks can still occur. The off masks, so when my mask is on, I wanna make sure that I am in my cohort, seated three to five feet. Um, but when I'm eating and my mask is off, I wanna make sure that my seated eating area is anywhere around eight, eight feet radius, eight foot radius. So that is where we're working with elementary principals to identify spaces that classrooms for breakfast, for example, or for snack break, as long as students mask off, um, are able to eat with that eight foot radius. So it is some creative scheduling, but we want to try to simulate as much of our normal activities as we normal as we would, and snack break is part of that. Um, so groups might have, we might have small group snack break, or we might have rotating in the classroom, um, but we will be able to just try to make sure that we ensure that if we're masks off, we're that eight foot radius um, that has been designated for eating. Next question is, should students bring a brown paper bag every day to store their mask while it's off so it stays clean? I'll take that one too. Actually, um, I think Mrs. Schneider might be on. I bet you she's in her office and she could grab one of those green bags. I want me to but grab one? Yeah, go grab one. So I'm going to give kudos to Woodland, um, who um, were nice enough to pilot a uh, cinch bag that we're actually uh, purchasing for each elementary student. Um, so we piloted with a company and got some green ones for Woodland. Each of the other elementaries will be able to also get this, but every student, Ms. Schneider, every student will have a cinch bag, right? And their name will go on the outside. This will be where our mask goes when it's mask break. Um, and then go ahead, Mrs. Schneider. Do you want to? You want me? Am I am you can hear me? No, oh, you're good. Did I do okay. a good elementary snack break bag? So well, <laughs> I think the the piece is, is that we don't want the masks laying on a desk. We don't want hands all over them. We don't want them left all around. And so um, we were working or talking with um, some elementary an elementary principal in a neighboring district who's been in for a very long time, and they have not had cases. And this was one of the great ideas that he shared and um, told us to run with it if we wanted to. Um, so the idea is, is that the kids can have this um, sitting at their seat and they can put their masks in it so that they don't um, fall on the floor, get dirty laying around, but then they also have the cinch sack. So if they're maybe depending on the building, if they're able to head to the art room, they can carry their materials right in it. So it's got kind of multi-purpose. Uh, for that. So um, we got the ones with the uh, stripes on them so we can write their names right on it. So when they go out to recess, they can keep it with them, um, sit it on the sidewalk or, or wherever they are or wear it on their backs, depending what they're doing, um, and then keep it with them. But we can make sure they have it when it's time to line up and come in. So so, Mrs. Schneider, I want to thank you for piloting that, and um, you got a school color, right, to match oh, of your kiddos. So we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna actually could. we're gonna work together to make sure that each of the elementaries and gate students um, also have that same that vendor we really like. It's high quality. Um, we know it works, and we're excited about that accommodation. So and these you. would these would stay in school. So you know, at the end of the day, they would hang them on the back of their chair or it would go into their individual cubby or hook that they have so that they would have it at school every day. Great job, thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, will elementary students in person have early release also on Wednesdays? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. So whether you're remote, whether you're uh, in seat, uh, there is uh, early release on Wednesdays. We do have childcare available for folks that would need that uh, to accommodate that, that Wednesday early release. Uh, so um, again, we're making that available for families. Uh, some instructional questions. We have, uh, are the elementary teachers in the younger grades, particularly like K-1, able to interact with students at all or will they have to stay behind their desks uh, or behind plastic protectors? Anyone want to field that question? 
So I can say that our principals have set up um, classrooms to accommodate our littles. And we've been working um, with our ELC, uh, early childhood, um, and our child care in similar way all summer and all fall long. So the kids will get up, be able to get up and move. And that's why the masks are so important. But we, when they are um, in there, they'll still be spaced out in their seats, but we will make sure that they're not glued to those seats all day long. So it's, it does take some, some collaboration with families and teaching and making sure that we all understand that we're trying to keep germs away and we keep making sure that we're uh, washing our hands and using hand sanitizer, but that's definitely something that we know kids need to do. They need to wiggle, they need to move. So Can I we're say not something. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> this this is the I don't know where some of uh, you know, like the ideas come. I mean, we hear lots of things and um, you know, we have had a lot of great conversation with teachers and you know, thinking outside of the box. And I think the big thing is we're going to follow the guidelines that we need to. And now that we have guidelines, we're able to think about how we can still root elementary instruction in a way that is familiar and meets the social and the academic learning, you know, and, and keeping each other safe. But our, our plan, my plan, and I'll only speak for me, is that instruction needs to happen, interaction needs to happen, and we're going to be safe in the way that we do it, as safe as we can possibly be with the protocols that are in place. Um, I, I'm ready to see kiddos, <laughs> um, and we'll figure out the rest. Some of the ideas that teachers and paraprofessionals and secretaries um, have come up with to do things differently but still meet those needs has been absolutely incredible. And the plans that we have um, and, are, and, are, and continue to work on and adapt are as solid as they can be right now, you know? And so uh, for those people that are ready to come back, we're ready to have you. And if you're not ready, we understand that piece, you know, and we'll make sure that your remote instruction is, um, great as well. So um, this is where it's 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 level of comfort and it is um, understood and respected, whatever that decision is. But our goal, day in and day out, is safety and security and that feeling for kids and for parents. And that's what we're making decisions on right now. And the academics piece is super important, and we want that that'll happen. Our teachers know how to do that. We're focusing on those other pieces, that safety and security piece. So um, we, each, in the build, each building has to be a little bit individualized. And so that's why, you know, Dr. Schwarz and Ms. Brunei and Mrs. Monroe can't, aren't able to give exact specifics, but, but we have those ready. So we'll be getting those to people. Thank you, Mrs. Snyder. Uh, next question, and again, this is Colleen uh, for you. Uh, it is, can you please clarify the days per week and hours for elementary learning in seat? Sure, absolutely. So we have, um, we have four days a week. I think that um, we're looking at, at slide 29. Great, okay, so four days a week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, we will be going to school at the regular bell times that we, are, we have become accustomed to. So 8.32 to 3.39 for our four elementaries, and I will, um, if we go to slide 30, you can see Gates start is eight o'clock, and 3.01 is their release. However, on Wednesdays, we will be releasing early. So the early release schedule for our elementaries is, um, I believe, at two o'clock. So our elementary, uh, four elementary schools will be releasing at two o'clock on Wednesdays. So that is going to give our, our teachers that time to collaborate and work together, whether they are remote or in person. So that happens for both our remote and our in-person elementaries will be dismissing at that time. If you could uh, 
click on Gates schedule quickly. And um, you can see that Gate is in block schedules. So um, we are looking at half of their, their day or half of their schedule on an A day or and, and then a B day is the other half of the schedule. So the duty is for the teachers, uh, students enter during that time and we begin instruction at eight. And then if you slide down, you can see that they are released at 301 and then that same exact time will happen at, um, on, their, on, on their B day. They'll just go to their other half of classes. On those Wednesdays, um, the gate students will see all of their classes. So that's a little bit different. At the elementaries, um, we are releasing at two o'clock and those schedules will have to be shifted as well. Can I pop in here real quick too, Colleen? Yes. yes. Um, Julie, if you would scroll down a little bit in that, in that spreadsheet. So we have, um, GATE is a little bit unique because we have um, students that go to the middle school for some of their classes. So, um, so anyway, we do follow closely more with the middle school schedule, but uh, we do release at two, or excuse me, 301 on our regular days. And if you keep going down, Julie, our Wednesdays are unique because they are now going to be an A, B day, which means that like Colleen said, they're going to attend all of their classes on Wednesdays. They're just not the 90 minute blocks, they're 45 minute blocks approximately. Um, and then our early release time is 105. Um, so um, on Wednesdays, every Wednesday, it would be 105 for GATE. Thank you, Mrs. Martin. So I hope that answers the question about uh, times, days and times. So we, um, I know it can be a little confusing as we're going from um, our regular elementaries and to our GATE school, but Basically, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday still have all of the bookends, and then we have about 100 minutes of release time on Wednesdays so that our teachers can plan and work together. Thank you, Colleen. You're welcome. A uh, question about uh, remote instruction. So for those folks that are choosing to stay remote, uh, is that format going to change? Uh, we understand that teachers and classmates may change, but will the daily schedule and workload remain the same to help children with consistency? I'm sorry, can you say that again? So for those, those families that are choosing remote, is that format going to change? So teachers and classmates may change, but will the daily schedule and workload remain the same uh, to help children with maintaining consistency. So if we could go back to the elementary remote sample. Earlier I was explaining how this is a sample schedule. Uh, as things stand right now, all specials are in the afternoon. We cannot maintain that when we go back. So this is still a sample schedule with specials in the afternoon, but we could easily slide those specials into the morning, which means you may have math or reading in the afternoon. You may have social studies or science in the morning, depending on the, on the, um, the schedule of how specials will work. However, the students will be instructed in similar ways where there is synchronous and asynchronous instruction. So if the, the mode of delivery will be the same, you just may have, you won't have all of that live chunked in the morning and then only specials in the afternoon. It will be more spread out throughout the day based on how the master schedule comes out. That's about as much detail as I can give at this point because we need our, uh, everybody to respond to our surveys on whether or not they're coming in person or remote so that we can build our master schedules. Once we build our master schedules, we, we will be able to give a more concrete schedule to a remote student so that they know when their specials are and when their um, synchronous and asynchronous instruction is with their regular teacher. 
We do have teacher and planning office hours at the end of the day um, still listed here for our remote. So um, they will be doing independent work towards the end of the day. And that should remain intact. So by um, 2.50, they should not be live any longer, but that could happen a little earlier than that if they're doing an asynchronous um, work or they're working in small groups. All right, a uh, question about specials. Um, how will specials classes be handled to accommodate both in-person and remote students? Well, specials teachers will um, be scheduled in the master schedule like I was explaining earlier. So they will only see a class that is a fully in-person in class or a fully remote class. So if a, um, if a specials teacher is seeing a first grade class and it is all remote, then they're going to be seeing them as they have been um, online or it is um, possible for them to get, give them an assignment and get them started on something. I will tell you it is difficult to do some of our specials in the way we normally do them in person. We just met with specials today, all of them at the elementary. They were wonderful. Um, trying to really think about how we can make our, um, our in-person and our remote experience as, um, as, as familiar as possible, but still be safe. So in-person, I know that there are questions that have been submitted about PPE and, um, or how we're gonna do it and be safe. And we will have PPE for our, um, our students in choir and, or that are singing, uh, in music classes, or uh, we'll be doing spacing in PE classes. And um, in remote, we will have to use technology to help us out, just as we have been throughout the spring and this fall. So the, the plans are underway. We are using um, our consultants at Oakland Schools, some of our colleagues at neighboring districts who have been at work doing this kind of work, and we're collaborating with our teaching staff to make sure that we continue to offer specials to our students, whether they are remote or in person. Many of the details do have to be worked out, but our policies are beginning to form. Uh, question about lanyards. So do you recommend mask lanyards? And oh. I believe we have, uh, we have those, so. I can answer. Okay. Or, go ahead, Aaron. I also ordered lanyards to start before I ordered the cinch sacks. Um, and then we were having some more we reading have in our house. for that, um, for safety reasons, sometimes um, we had lanyards that would detach, but when our little kids are playing out at recess, we just want to make sure they're as safe as possible. So we went to the backpack as opposed to the lanyards. But my teachers wear the lanyards because it makes it a lot easier because it's right with you. So, and I think secondary is thinking about the lanyards. Thank you. Um, we have a question about kids going to the library and story reading and how to, uh, get books into kids' hands. I can speak about that one. Okay, thanks, David. Yep, so we've been talking about the importance of library and the importance of students still being able to check out books and wanting to try to um, make sure we're, we're creating that, that opportunity for our students. And so what we're planning on doing is having the librarian visit the classroom and read a story to the students and then also bringing books into the classroom that the students will be able to check out and then um, they'll be able to keep for the for the week or two, and then um, rotate them through. Uh, we've been given guidance from from local libraries that they've been quarantining books for 96 hours. So it's like a week at a time that we would set the books aside and have a rotation of every other week, um, be able to bring those books back out again. And so that way, students can can still check out a book and also bring those books back, and we can quarantine them safely before having another student check them out. I can pop in here for gate too. We have a online request form that students are going to be using because all of our books are listed on a spreadsheet with 
various information about each, each of the books and the students will have a time each week to request books to check out. And then um, either teachers um, or I <laughs> will be helping with that to make sure um, students can get books in their hands each week as well. And we're also following that same 96 hour um, book quarantine, if you will. We're creating book bathtub bins in uh, our uh, classrooms because kids will also be able to borrow from the, the teachers' collections, the libraries that they have within their rooms as well. And when they turn a book in, then it just goes into the, instead of calling it the quarantine tub, it's we're going to call it the book bathtub so they can have it. Well, thank you. Thank you. And that actually exhausts the questions that we've received this evening. I believe we've covered, covered everything, uh, but we still are leaving open the opportunity to submit questions. Uh, so uh, you can still send your questions in. Uh, again, the address is avondale.boe at avondaleschools.org. That's avondale.boe at avondaleschools.org uh, and we will uh, reach out to you to get those questions answered. We are also putting together an FAQ uh, for uh, questions that were submitted uh, for this meeting today, uh, as well as ongoing questions uh, to come in. Uh, so uh, we will have uh, th those FAQs available for folks. They'll be on our website. Um, also, uh, you will be getting uh, more information, I'll say more granular information as well as we move toward uh, where we're implementing. So uh, from your individual schools, uh, because each of your individual schools will have uh, somewhat uniqueness because of their unique facilities. Um, and uh, that information will be coming to you from your building principals uh, as we move closer uh, in the process uh, to, you know, to those, to the dates of implementation. Uh, they will come in the variety of either coffees or uh, individual school town halls, uh, as well as uh, uh, emailed communications and so on. So uh, you certainly will be getting more and more information. This is just the tip of the iceberg uh, of information as we go uh, toward that end. Uh, the information will become more granular, more personalized, to your school, to your grade level and such as we, uh, as we proceed uh, through the coming weeks. So please look forward to that information. Uh, again, the latest information will be found also on our website uh, where you can go in and look at, uh, uh, again, the upcoming FAQs and so on. Uh, but again, as you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, again, avondale.boe at avondaleschools.org uh, and we will get back to you uh, with those uh, with those answers to those questions as, as we have them. So um, we appreciate you tuning in this evening. Um, we're going to be transitioning to our secondary portion of, of the evening and addressing uh, secondary specific questions uh, and protocols. Uh, so we thank elementary folks. We thank you for, for joining us this evening. Uh, and again, please don't hesitate to reach out with additional questions. Dr. Schwartz, can I make one recommendation? <laughs> Absolutely. For no, but like for our students that are returning to see this is how, can I just show you really quick how you look here's the for our students that are returning to see the position um, I recommend practicing and having students start practicing wearing those masks so that way they get in the habit of it so that way they have time to to, to, to experience it and um, and rather than just thinking all of a sudden they're gonna come right back to school and be good with wearing a mask for long periods of time starting with a little bit of time doing um, things in the house and maybe wearing it for a little bit just to get used to wearing it while doing things, maybe not outside because uh, they might be used to going to the store and wearing one and then coming in the car and just taking it right off. But maybe doing things at home, just getting practice doing that um, ahead of time would be helpful for students. Thank you, Mr. Getz. We really appreciate that. 